in the last talk of this talk series, I'm actually going to uh, a recent example we have been working on in my group using it the popular version. And actually, half, first half of the talk, I will talk a bit also how we actually had to work on the atomistic model first to get that one right before we actually could do the mapping and then look at it. So it's yeah, the polymer I'm using um, is actually P3HT, polythiopene, it's one of the polythiopene family, and which is mixed with polarines, which is very often used for organic photovoltaics. It's the P3HT, PCPM mixture, is essentially the proof of my model for bar uh, for junction. It's not the record, far from it actually. The record these days in efficiency is about I think about 12% or something like that. But here we are talking about 5% more because it's the most studied model of organic photovoltaics. And a lot of the stuff I'm talking about you actually find in this book chapter, which is a innovative view book on photovoltaics actually, where we've been invited to talk about hospital modeling. And yeah, all the other references of course are at the end of the talk. So, organic photovoltaics. This first statement is what obviously motivates the study here. In one hour, we get more energy from the sun than the whole Earth needs in one year. So, obviously, we wouldn't have an energy problem if we could harvest the energy of the sun in a more useful way. Um, what you see here are actually pictures of organic photovoltaic systems. So, these are polymer based photovoltaics. Uh, the normal photovoltaic systems you know are silicon based. They are um, air efficiency significantly higher, no question about it, than the organic ones. But the organics have the advantage that they are obviously bendable. You can make them in any shape. And one of the ideas is that in the future you can use essentially organic photovoltaic coatings as um, coloring. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I I don't know exactly what that number is, but <laughs> but I think there is still uh, if we say that plants use even if they use half of it, it will still be very good. <laughs> and what you see here on the right, this is actually a a bus stop in San Francisco where they have put some organic photovoltaics on top and they use it to illuminate at night the oh, oh, obviously the um, advertisements there. <laughs> so, a little bit of background. This is essentially the basics of the uh, organic photovoltaic cell. The light comes from the bottom here. Um, we have normally something like a glass um, to, to cover it. <coughs> and we have an ITO, indium tin oxide, which is the standard transparent electrode. If you have your LCD TV screen, any flat screen TV, they all have an ITO layer because it's essentially the only mass produced um, transparent electrode. And that's not an issue here because indium is one of the rare herbs and China. Has 90% of the market there. So people try to get a bigger bike to but by now it has not yet happened. And yes, normally what we call a blocking layer in order to prevent direct, some direct contacts. Then this is what we will talk about this polymorphic layer. They are actually the transformation of energy from solar energy from the line to the electric, the electric energy is going to happen. And then there is a cathode on the back. And that one obviously that does not have to be transparent because the light comes from here. And you don't have that problem. So what happens in here, this polarine? And these are the two materials which we largely talk about. This is P3HT, this is the electron donor. This is the polymer, the polymerization direction is long here along the thiopy rings. And PCBM is this is mono PCBM, so we have only one substitution, so this is a C60 cage with this side chain here. Um, 
they, they have the, um, most thiophene following mixtures, if you mix them, they remix. That is on the one hand good because we need an interface, but the problem is if you have a system like that, that will not work. Of course, why is that? If light hits your system, it forms what is called an exciton. An exciton is a bound pair of an electron in the hole. So we don't separate the charges all together, but we separate the charges into an intermediate state. So, with this exciton, <coughs> it will diffuse around, and only if it hits an interface within the system, in its lifetime, it will separate into a true electron and a true hole, and then, of course, you generate an electron, then it generates a photocurrent. If they recombine before, that photocurrent is lost. Then the system just um, produces, then you just heat up the system. No um, the problem is, this electron, this layer is about 10 nanometers. It has to be about 10 nanometers because that's the external diffusion. On the other hand, you need about 100 nanometer thickness of the system in order to get a reasonable electron, at least a reasonable extension coefficient. So if you have only about 10 nanometer thick layers, you don't absorb enough water to make the system any way wild. So what people come up with is what is called a bulk heterojunction. That's a self-assembled system which <laughs> which is a bicontinuous phase of P3HD and fluorines, where no point ideally is more than 10 nanometers away from it. And that is the system works. The two materials are the electron donor is 43 hexyl thiopene. The electron acceptor is 6,6-phenyl C6 bond butyric acid methyl ester. This is, this I call P3HD, this is piece of candy. So what happens, this one gives an electron to this one. That's essentially the idea. This donates the electron, this accepts the electron. The elect, uh, you have here the C6, the, the uh, ring, and you have this side chain, this is essentially a hex, this is a, a hexane, so that therefore we have the hexane here. But this is a C6, you have this ring, and then the next ring comes. And normally we have what's called a regular ritual. So we have one side chain going up from the next polymer is essential. The next monomer is flipped upside down so that the ring is going down. And they are interspersed with these pieces again. This is actually a STM, scanning transmission electron microscopy picture of the system. This is actually a low PCBM concentration, much lower than you would really use in a, in a real system. This is, um, this is, but it's a PHG uh, device. This is about 20 nanometers, and these dots here are actually. Well, this is the system you want to look at. Um, and with that, we need, we want to do the, Start originally actually with a mixture of P3HD and um, C60. So normal C60, and I will come back to that later and do the more training on that. But currently, we actually had to develop a model for PCBM because PCBM has been essentially not really studied um, using molecular simulation before. So we had to start doing quantum chemistry on these systems to calculate the charges that we then use into our atomistic molecular simulation and then go one step up and do the coarse grain. So this is essentially a three-tiered a three multi-scale modeling exercise. Um, yes? Um, we essentially we use jump charges. Jump charges. Yes, we'll come to that in a second. Oh. Um, these are the typical materials. We will use them later on lamps in this case, because the poster we did that was more familiar with lamps than Chromex, so we just use that. There is a biofilm model around, which was developed by Marco and Rouse. He actually had also to do some quantum chemistry for the torsions in the uh, in P3HT, so quantum chemistry on the polymer as well. And so this is the, the mapping which we later on use. We'll use a 3 to 1 mapping for each one of our polymer. 
So if we did relatively simple P3 lift, 3 to 1G base set, because we don't need that exactly the charge, but we just need the charge reasonably, and we did a bit of structural optimization, and we used different ways of uh, partial charge. We started with small and then they run this charge. So this is how they how PCBM looks like. This is C60, and this is the slide cage. And what how we color this is is colored by charge. So the black means eventually the probe. The good news is that the side group essentially doesn't charge the cage. That means if we are interested, especially also now in this PCBM, we can use the same model for the different performance. If that wouldn't be the case, or if this would have significant polarization on the page, then you would have different, you would have to use different charge distributions for different isomers. And that, of course, would, it would break out of no, the diagnostic simulation and with the cross grain as well. So this was essentially, we showed that this works. And these are different versions of this PCBM isomers because ex experimentally people <laughs> could separate them. But it would be very expensive. The question is, do we need to? Are the one of the questions we are at the moment working on, is it actually worth to separate the different one, the different isomers or not? If it's not worth, yeah, we just leave it. But if one of them is significantly better than the others, then people would start looking into selecting that for that particular one. And we see that the charge distribution of these multi adducts is not affected much by the configuration. So we chose we take one joint top model So this is how the PCBM force bill looks like. Everybody, I guess, know how that this force bill looks like. We use um, OPLS all atom. Um, so we have bonded distributed, force bonded angle. Then we have a white of development shape for torsion. Everybody knows what a white of development shape for torsional potential is. Um, you can, in torsional potential, you essentially can atomistically do two ways. You can do a Fourier series, there you have the cosine squared, cosine cubed, and so on, or you can do cosine 2 phi, cosine 3 phi, cosine 4 phi. These are the two different versions. And then, of course, we have the electric. So, the first thing we did is we want to count it. We want to just to validate all these yeah? So, we threw these two PCBMs in Water as well as an hexane. <coughs> Calculate the potential of being force in the low molecular weight solvent. Obviously, in water they have to cluster, in hexane they shouldn't cluster as bad. And the main question is especially how do these PCBM clusters look like? Because there is evidence that PCBM actually clusters into dimers in the BHG devices. So, therefore, we want to characterize the configuration of. So, these are the regular distribution functions in hexane and in water. And you see that water is essentially, it's essentially flat here. Um, and in hexane, you see this one peak. This is how the simulations were started. But we put all the, all, all the hexane actually first originally just on the lattice, just to set up the system. And we set it up with different starting configurations uh, because we didn't know how quickly these timers would form and how badly they were set up. But you see that they all reorient very quickly. This is this is just plain and so we didn't do any umbrella sampling or anything here because the simulations were fast enough and we could sample the distribution as of distance as of, um, in the simulation and then just by the inverting the distance distribution we get a potential of being force. In this case it's actually exact. Because we only have two molecules, so therefore it is truly the potential of reinforce. It would have more molecules like in the um, typical IBI. This inversion is not exact because then you have to do the iteration. But in this case, just to get the PMF out, as you only have two molecules, there's only one degree of freedom. This is the exact inversion. And these are the, you see a difference between water. And hexane for water, you see there's one dip, one big dip, and essentially they just cluster together and in reality would precipitate out of the water if you had more than two. 
and for hexane there is a dip, which is not as deep, and then there is some range. So the hexane is a weak solvent for this instance. And that agrees very well with the experiment. And this is that how we, we did the same now for the bis, so more than one side group and got the potential of mean force as well. And we see that essentially the potential of mean force, they are all similar, but they are, especially for some of them, the distance and contact are different. So essentially they take, measure the cage the, the cage distance and depending how they are um, substituted, the cages can get closer or not closer, which may have a significant effect on the electron transport. And that is especially a lot of it is a <coughs> Because they try to hit each other with the cages in most cases, especially in the polar zones. So, this is the real charge distribution which we got out of the of CPM. You see that the cage itself is essentially really uncharged. And then um, we have here the red is negative and green is positive. Here, of course, the hydrogens are slightly positive, the carbons are slightly negative, because carbons are negative and hydrogen. And then you have this system. And this is weakly polar. One of the main reasons actually for the side group is also that it makes the C60 dissolve at least in some things. And always is we dissolve C60 in anything is almost the same. C60 is a black color. And you it's it's a solid. And it's very hard to dissolve. But the PCB and especially the best PCB are at least to some extent easier to dissolve. There was a second epoch on the chemistry and it was a torsion potential. That is now on the PTHT on the five so for the PCBMs, you could just throw them into Gaussian, calculate them, and get the electric uh, get, get the charge So we need one calculation essentially for each PCBM performance. For the torsion potentials, that's a bit different. Anybody has done calculations of from the chemistry to calculate the torsion for using in your simulation? Any okay, few people? So what you do is you take the short piece of your polymer, one dimer, trimer, tetramer, how, how much what you think, and then you essentially manually turn along the bond you are interested in the torsion Which in this case is here, this is the backbone. This is the dimer of the thiamine, and you see this bond here is the backbone bond. So you start essentially with zero, you put the two rings in the blank, then you turn them, in our case, 15 degrees at a time. Do a one chemistry calculation like this, the next one is 30, 45, 60, and so on. You really turn them around. And you calculate then the energy of this construct as a function of this torsional angle. And then we fit a Fourier series, either a right of balance or a normal Fourier series, whatever you want, to this. So typically, <coughs> you afford something like three or four Fourier terms. And by that, then you have the potential, the torsion potential, which really represents your system. Why is it especially important for torsions? Why wouldn't you do this for the angles of all the bonds? What makes torsions different? Sorry? Yes, the torsions, yes, they are they are softer and they are uh, periodic. Yes, they are softer. And the polymer configuration, as well as actually as it same properties. Essentially, the single chain configuration is fully described by the The torsional angles, angles determine the polymer configuration or the protein configuration. 
If you talk about protein folding, what you're actually talking about is essentially the series of torsional states. And that is why we used this here. And the problem was when we started with the original simulation, uh, with the original model, uh, model which was available, and compared it to experiments, didn't agree. There are experiments on stacking of PTH chain, and these uh, wouldn't fit, you couldn't reproduce them with the existing potential. So therefore, we had to go back and say, okay, we need this or better portion. Otherwise, the whole core screening effort would be useless. As I said in the first talk, every flaw the animalistic core still has, the core screen core still will inherit. So if you start the wrong torsional potential here, which generates wrong configurations, the whole cost rating effort will never be useful. So therefore, we had to go back and had to get the right torsional potential. So I now do atomistic ID of these systems, and here are a few results of this. And then I show ever this picture here on the top right. The atomistic one is an atomistic result corresponding if it's the cost grade version of that picture. It's wrong. Um, we first calculated the chain stiffness atomistically. So this is the main. So up to now I've only talked about P3HG, that's the black or the blue. We, what we see is that the uh, side chains are actually slightly more stiff than the main chain of P3HG. And the stiffness goes slightly down to temperature, but not much. So we can, there is an indication already that the core strain potential may be available to cover a reasonable range of temperature. Temperatures are high here because we are in the melt, and the gas addition temperature of these beasts are in the range of 400 or something else. So and we wanted to, wanted to stay above, a significantly above gas position, that we have at least atomistically a chance to get this right. They actually have several gas positions, several crystallization temperatures, because we have many internal degrees of freedom. And there is a second polymer which we also started, which is PVTVT. Um, it, essentially, in that case, we showed that that one is actually stiffer, which means it can stack even better, and it's known that the electron transport of that one is actually more efficient. <coughs> because the electron transport ring goes normal to the polymer. The polymers have to stand onto each other and the transport is from ring to ring. And that's exactly what I show here. What I show here is, an is a static orientational correlation. Who knows what that is? It's a P2 of R. It's the same as the short polynomial as a function of this. What this means is the following. We take the ring norm, so we have all we have these rings along the back, <coughs> and we take and they are obviously defined by the normal of the ring. So we take this ring normal and we calculate the angle between this ring normal and another ring normal at distance r apart. So we have two of them. Then we calculate the second Legendre the point norm. So you know what the second Legendre the point norm is? Cosine alpha is the first. 3 cosine squared alpha minus 1, the whole thing 1 half is the second. 1 half, 3 cosine squared alpha minus 1, second. Um, and the advantage of that is, it's possible, it doesn't matter if the, and if the vector shows upward or downward. In our case, it doesn't make a difference because the ring is flat, we don't care if the ring is like this or like this. So we get a rate of that symmetry, and it is positive if they are parallel or oriented, it's negative if they are perpendicular. That's the, that's the meaning here of P2. And perpendicular, so this is kind of a sketch. Parallel means the two chains follow each other. Perpendicular means essentially they are wrapping around each other. And what we see here that the first neighbor is really parallelly stacked, whereas the second neighbor has only a slight <coughs> reference that can be parallelly stacked. So we have we have local stacking, but this stacking is at this temperature, not long range. At lower temperature we would get significant long range stacking, but in the melt we don't get significant long range stacking, we just get the next neighbor 
to stay at the second day was almost kind of an element. But what we do not see is what we see in a lot of other polymers, a big dip here. In most, if you have normal polymers, say you have a polyethylene or polystyrene, they don't start positive. P2 starts negative. And what that means is that two chains are essentially getting the closest, normally two chains can arrange it like this. And we don't get this configuration because the chains are locally too stiff that they can wrap around each other. This is the orientation of side chains, and here we see the negative because the side chains are significantly more, uh, at this temperature they are essentially just small alkane chains, and there we see the negative, positive, negative. So we see this orientation in the medium distance is this, and then again a uh, second distance like that. So the main chains stack the side chains at this temperature are quite disordered. So, so we looked at this atomistically, the atomistic makes sense, we did quantum chemistry for the atomistic, now we did it. Now we want to cause training because we have to go to like scales of hence ideally 100 ideas, which atomistically is not really possible. So this is again this is a, a trial of P2HD, and in this case we started with simple C60, we now do an optimization of PCBM. For PCBM actually we cannot do a one-to-one division. One big ball and a little ball for a second. These are simulation samples. I showed them already to you in one of the earlier talks as an example. But this is the atomistic simulation. This is the coarse grain simulation. These are the bond lengths and their potentials. So this is the P1, P1 bond, the P1, the P1, P2 bond, and the P2, P3 bond. What you see here now is that the P1 bond is nicely as we wanted. We couldn't get for the P2 and the P3 not these perfect single distributions as we had before. We played a bit around with positions along the backbone, but we just got a reasonable side chain mapping point that we had just one um, point. The reason is that the, back, the side chains that I showed you earlier are so floppy that there is just more than one state. And otherwise we would have to go with a 5 to 1 mapping for the back for the side chain and the essentially keep the side chain as realistic. And that defeats the purpose anyway. So that's what we did. There's one thing which I didn't talk about yet and I that is if you take going back to this here. It doesn't, it didn't matter here because in all the others we had before they were nice and peaked, so essentially there's one single peak. But now you have this much wider distribution. And there's something that becomes important, which is the Jacobian, which between the internal degrees of freedom and the degree of freedom, which come, has to come into the uh, inversion if you have a wider distribution, especially for angles as well. So who knows what Jacobian is? Okay. Good. One is that if you sample these bond lengths, bond angles, etc., you measure them in the internal coordinates. You measure them essentially in internal spherical coordinates in R and phi and theta. You don't measure them in the X, Y, C condition coordinates. So we have, we have essentially implicitly the coordinate transformation of the looking at. <coughs> so R is typical one of R is say square root X squared plus Y squared plus C squared. So in order not to bias the sampling, we need to normalize the distribution then by the correct Jacobian determinant. And then, for example, you get an R squared for the distance of the sine theta for the angles. And as we do pure optimization, you actually can do it without it, and it will, it will converge as well. But if you do the Jacobians, um, essentially you need one or two iterations, like we saw yesterday with the neuronal. Um, for the internal ones, you just need one or two iterations and you get it right. If you don't do, especially for the angles, don't do the Jacobians, you need significantly more equations. These are the bond angles and the corresponding potentials. And at this point, we now have to look at, we, we looked at something. Because these angles are, they are not as wide, it's not that bad, but the, the, the bad ones were quite 
brought, we looked at, oh, this one. We looked at the correlation of forms. This two dimensional graph, what this means, in this direction is the bond length, in this direction is the bond angle. So what we have here is at this bond length of, say, three and a half angstroms, we find a slightly lower angle than if we have a bond length of four angstroms. And here we see that the, there is uh, the bond lengths and the bond angles, they are, we have here one state which is entered is very favorite, which is about 4.2 to 150 or 160 degrees. What you want in this case is essentially only you want it. And then that is the range kind of either orthogonal uh, up or um, across. What you do not want is two big or two or even three big dips. So if you have something like a a dip here, a dip here, and a dip here. You have correlations between your bonds and your angles that you essentially need a two-dimensional potential, one angle potential, instead of a bond potential and angle potential. So this was validation that actually you could use the simple bond and the single angle potential because they are all both essentially just one. And the same thing we did actually. We also measured the dihedrals, and they are reasonably flat. But they were not perfectly flat, so in this, in this case, we actually used the dihedral angle potential in contrast to the polystyrene models I showed you earlier, where we said they were so flat that we did not use the dihedral angle potential on the phosphorus level. These are the LEFs. Optimized 550 Kelvin, one atmosphere. We um, looked at 3 HG, 60 molecules of 3. Uh, uh, 60 molecules of 12 mm of polylite. So what we did here, this is a mixture. But we said, as I said before, it makes sense to start to start with the homogeneous system first. And even in this homogeneous system, we already have three RDFs. Because we have the three points along the, <coughs> along the um, side chains, which we have to optimize. So we started with a pure Biofin optimization and got this, you see, the black and the red on the atomistic and the coarse grain, and we eventually got all of them perfectly matched. This was at 550 Kelvin. Then, after that, we put four rings in there, and actually we put a 1.851 weight to weight ratio in this case. Um, which is the experiment development one, and we got this as well. Um, as a, a, one point, okay, what we did, we did the optimization at 1.85 to 1 and 5.50. And this is uh, wrong here. What, because what we did here now is we did test at 1.27 to 1 and 5.50. That's the left one. So that's a different concentration, same temperature. We got that one right. This one is the same concentration as the optimized by the different temperature. And in both cases, we got that still dead on. That means the transferability of these models is given in the concentration and temperature range for which we actually would need it. And as I said in the talk yesterday, that is something you always have to check. And that's what we checked here in this case, that this works. We went actually one step further. We did a validation of coarse grain of densities. We simulated at a range of temperatures the system atomistically and coarse grain. And what we showed here is a plot of atomistic density versus coarse grain density for a number of different concentrations and a number of different temperatures. And they reasonably fall on the line. That means that in this case, even the compressibility of our coarse grain model, or our, not really the compressibility, the heat expansion coefficient of our coarse grain model is right. And, the, and that was, um, in this case, as I normally do NPT simulations, these were coarse grain NPT. We did coarse grain NPT simulations, 
of systems, I think about 12 by 12 by 12 nanometers, a bit bigger than the atomistic ones. And similar to them, we have here a concentration. A density range between 0.77 to 1.12. Yes? We did that once. So we, we said, we did that once. We said, at that point, 550K, 1.85 to 1. That's, the, that's our target system, which we optimized. And we optimized that the pressure was right at that point. We did everything there. And now we used that model at different concentrations and at different temperatures and simulated and measured the density as well as the structure. And here we plot now density atomistic against density cost rate. <coughs> now, is that okay? As this one looks that well, we may even play the ground and try by hand. Um, the left hand side is the relative diffusion coefficients between atomistic and coarse grain, and we see that they are now jumping around quite a bit at temperatures out of different concentrations. So we did, we simulated different concentrations, and we see at 550 we get about 3 to 4 speed up, at 650 we get about 2 to 3 speed up. What I show on the right hand side is the relative orientation. So if we just have, if we just would have a simple speed up, like Monica said, then we, then we just can rescale time if you're good. However, the different dynamic modes in the system may be sped up at different ratios. So what we measure here is the reorientation times of the chain and vectors. So as I showed, told you already before, there are static orientation correlation points. So you measure P2 with another in distance. Now what we have here this is in time. So it's the autocorrelation function of how a vector reorients. So you take a vector at time zero and a vector at time t later. You measure its angle and again do the second short polynomial. And that defines a reorientation time. And we can do that holistically and cross grain that it's um, a for short polymers. And you see here the speed up is not exactly the same. We have about 2 at 650 and about 3 at 550. So that means that the reorientation and the diffusion have different ratios in the atomers to get the cost rate. Which clearly tells you that the dynamics in the systematic cost rate model is kind of okay, but it's not the same. You have the different methods. But now we can do things which we cannot do atomistic anymore. We go to, this is, these are now boxes, 25 by 25 by 25. You're talking here of 115,000 cross grain polygons. That's a few million atomistic. And this one took 24 hours on 256 processes. So this was run again, I think it was run at Pacific North. No, it was run at NERSC in uh, National Energy Research Computer Center in Berkeley. Um, and these are now 48 months. So we went to 48 months instead of to 12 months. So we went up spec of 4 on chain length. And this is in the region of Gauss dynamics, so we expect uh, reorientation uh, correlation times go up by a factor of 16. So you need to say move them away 16 times long before it. Or 48 more than 12. And the concentration is um, one which is reasonably close to the uh, experimental one. I think it was again 1.27 to 1. They show here. And this was actually a cool installation. So we, you don't see much here. We, got the, we have the blue ones are the C60s, and the yellow ones are the most great sides of the polymer. And we cool this up, we set it up randomly at 550, and now we start to cool down slowly towards its last little time. So, you don't see much here, you see much more here. You look at plus function. And why is that important? Because what I said before, the system you really need is a system which is a bi continuous phase. So, we have a continuous polymer phase. A continuous C60 phase, 
And these spaces have to have irregular phase boundaries. This is the system we experiment we need. This is the system we need for a bike heterojunction problem. And we know what, what I show here in blue are the full rings which belong to the largest class one in the system. We define two full rings if they are closer than 1.2 nanometers apart from each other as belonging to the same cluster. And now we met the term full ring clusters and the, I only visualize here the largest cluster in the system. Everything else is little yellow dots. So the little yellow dots can, in this case, be either polymers or full rings. And the big blue dots are the full rings which belong to the largest of the clusters. And you clearly see that this cluster is growing. It starts to essentially fill space, but it starts to fill space in an irregular way. And at the same time, we are coming close to the last transition temperature. So this structure, if you cool a bit further down, will be frozen. And that's exactly the structure we actually need in these systems. Experimentally, we don't, trend, we don't do the class transition, in this case by cooling down, but by solving the temperature. So they do the, the, simulate the experiment at constant temperature, but they start with solvent in the system and they evaporate the solvent and by that get out to the glass condition. Okay, that's what I wanted to tell you today. So we developed the structural cost rate model of P3H and four in lectures. We used the iterative Boltzmann inversion to use to do this and study this really in an in integration with this kind of group. We see that this upper polymer slide is lower strong orientation ordering, and we actually get the morphologies. This was at 25 nanometer length scale. Now we are going to larger, we are getting more computer time and go to now really the 100 by 100 system. That's really what we need for the device. So we want to simulate really a significant piece of an OPE device. And then in the end, of course, also. You can expect that at the interface to the next part of the device, we have service effects, and all of that will in the end have to be That's at a moment where things are going. Um, I thank the people in my group in this space, in this case especially um, Rudy, who is doing work on the polymers. Um, David was a postdoc in my group, he's now lecturing in um, Australia, and Adam, this picture from his own home, from his own home page. Um, he is a assistant professor who does experiments on these systems. And we got computer time from NERSC. And these are the references I have been <coughs> using for this time.